opposing liberalism with more liberalism. These are notes on Nick Wright. My main points in this talk are to explain what liberalism was and when it came to exist, and to ask whether colonial, fa colonial slavery was the foundation of capitalist industry in Britain. Why am I commenting on this? Because of an article I spotted um, that had been in the Morning Star and is still online, which is called Illusions in Liberalism Still Like a Fog still lie like a fog on our thinking. Well, the author certainly has a foggy mind and has a lot of illusions. The author's called Nick Wright. The thrust of his article is he is saying liberals are outraged at Braverman's immigration policy. Fair enough. But he says liberalism slides easily into right-wing authoritarianism. And he cites as an example of that Orban, who originally presented himself as a liberal. And he says, we must oppose the mystification which hides liberalism's shared heritage with the atavistic values of colonialism and slavery, which is the source of capital accumulation in every European and North American state. I can scarcely think of a more ridiculous piece of nonsense for a communist paper to have published. Now let's look at this. Slavery is the source of capital accumulation in every European and North American state, he says. Well, this claim has absolutely nothing to do with Marx's analysis of capital accumulation. He's starting off from a naive, liberal idea of what primitive accumulation was, an accumulation just of money. And he lines up with what is actually a major thread of US Democratic Party liberal ideology. In order to argue against liberalism, Nick is accusing of some it of supporting or economically relying on slavery. Now there are two objections to this. One is that it's historically inaccurate, completely inaccurate. But worse than that, it accepts the actual moral foundations of Christ of liberalism. And he then criticizes liberal capitalism for allegedly resting on a hypothetical hy hypocritical violation of these moral principles. Now, this is very different from the Marxian position, which is that capitalist exploitation arises from the very enforcement of liberal principles of freedom, equal right, rather than their violation. The whole point of Marx's capital was to argue that. Now, there's also awful confusions about when did liberalism arise. He talks about the golden age of liberalism coinciding with slavery. Well, the golden age of liberalism was under Gladstone, long after slavery had been abolished. Oh, what are a couple of centuri centuries. This is from Nick. He says, in his considerations on representative government, the English liberal, John Stuart Mill, conceived of the British Empire in particular as a guarantee of friendly cooperation among nations. He was writing at the height of British imperial supremacy and deep into the Industrial Revolution, a revolution capitalised by slave labour that gave Britain its head start in global warming. Global warming? Never mind. Mill's Evasion survived neither the 19th century conflicts with the French, Dutch and Spanish rivals or the 20th century challenge of a rising imperial Germany. I mean, what kind of history did he ever learn? It's the most awful confusion of historical periods. There was no rivalry between Britain and either Spain or Holland at the time Mill was writing, which is the mid-19th century. There was some rivalry with France over colonies in Africa, 
but the rivalries with the Spanish and the Dutch belong to the 16th and 17th century, 300 or 200 years before Mill. And here is Nick saying it didn't survive the, 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 the 19th century conflicts with them. It's just dream stuff. Now, there's no doubt that Mill supported the British Empire in India. He was, after all, an employee of the British East India Company. But like most 19th century English liberals, he was vehemently opposed to, liber to slavery. He strongly supported the North against the Confederacy, and he wrote a polemic against the Confederacy called The Contest in America where he strongly takes the case against the Confederacy. In a short video like this, it's not the place to cite long passages from that polemic, but it's worth having a look at. Because liberal political economists like Mill and Cairns were very perceptive critics of the slave mode of production. And in fact, Cairns' book, The Slave Power, is well worth reading for any Marxist even today. Now, Nick is standing British history on its head. Liberalism didn't exist as a political or ideological movement until the 1820s. It represented the interests of the new industrial middle classes, in French terminology, the bourgeois, against the old Tory alliance of landlords, rentiers and slave owners. This is Google Ngram uh, data showing when the word liberalism appeared in print. And you see, it doesn't start appearing in print until just before the 1820s. It takes off just after the abolition of the slave trade. And it peaks for the first time when, the, when slavery was abolished in the British Empire. Peaks again when the old Whig Party is actually replaced with the Liberal Party. It is a, liberalism is a specific 19th century ideology of the British industrial bourgeoisie, and it was vehemently anti-slavery. Now, Nick is re relying on Lozordo's book, and Lozordo knows more history than Nick, but he, he also anachronistically projects 19th century ideology of liberalism onto 17th century politics. For instance, he thinks Locke was a liberal. The problem with this is it's an entirely idealist approach. History is not a struggle between ideas like liberalism and absolutism. It's a series of struggles between specific classes. And these classes may pick up ideas that were advanced by long dead authors. Uh, to, as justifications for what they're doing now. 19th century liberals did cite Locke, but English revolutionaries cited the Old Testament. But the Book of Amos is no guide to the policies of Cromwell. Now let's look at his other assertion, that slavery built the Industrial Revolution. It's a left liberal trope, which is an empirically false one. Why is it liberal? Because it starts off with a well-established liberal condemnation of slavery, something the ideolog ideologues of the industrial bourgeoisie, like Mill, were quite happy to state. It then attempts to turn this into a critique of capitalism by asserting that slavery was the original sin of capitalism, that it was born from that. Okay. Now... Nick actually says the same thing as Kenny McCaskill, who was the former Justice Secretary for Scotland and is now an MP for the Alba Party, who in a article in The Scotsman says, the industrialisation of Scotland also stands in contrast to Ireland. It wasn't just down to James Watt and geography. Finance from slavery provided a large part of it. That's why Scotland as a whole not just some families and institutions need to atone for slavery. <laughs>
This is real pernicious middle class liberal guilt tripping. And it, it's shameful that uh, the Morning Star publishes stuff that goes along with this. I mean, did slaves build any of these things? Canals, railways, mills, the Colebrookdale Iron Bridge, Colebrookdale fire furnaces, any one of hundreds of derelict mills you can still see by the riversides. I mean, you only have to ask the question to see how ridiculous it is. No. All of the fixed capital, all the plant and machinery on which the English and Scottish Industrial Revolutions was based, was re built by local waged workers. None of it was built by slaves. I mean, what world are you living in? The slaves that were owned by the British slave-owning class were in the West Indies. And they were forced to grow sugar. Sugar was a luxury product that was sold to the upper classes, to the gentry. And it's very hard to construct a theory by which upper class sugar consumption causes industrialization. People like Nick and Kenny McCaskill don't even attempt it. They just assert it. But as soon as you try, try following down the implications, you see how absurd it is. Let's look at the scale of it. British sugar imports in the late 18th century, coming up to the start of the 19th century, were running at about 40,000 tonnes a year. Now that sounds quite a lot, but for a population of 10 million, which is roughly what it was then, this is equivalent to about two teaspoons a day per head. Nowadays, we eat about 10 times as much as that, equivalent of 20 to 30 teaspoons per head. Now, we don't take it all in tea. We obviously have all sorts of sweetened foods, and it constitutes, therefore, quite a considerable number of calories per day, maybe of the order of 400 calories per day. If you go back to the 19th century, start of the 19th century, it would amount to about 40 calories per day across the whole population if the, the sugar consumption was equally spread across the whole population. Of course it wasn't. As a luxury good, it was mainly consumed by the gentry and upper classes. Now, as a thought experiment, suppose the EU gave Niger free for 40 years, or 50 years, two sugar lumps per head of population. Would that cause Niger to become industrialised? Obviously not. To industrialise, they would need machinery. They would need capital goods. Why then were these sugar imports supposed to have caused British industrialisation? There's nothing magical about sugar. The fact that sugar is produced by slaves doesn't give it any potentiality to be something other than sugar. Finance from slavery is McCaskill's answer. Well, there's no doubt that some slave owners could become rich from sugar sales, but where did that money come from? The money all came from the revenues of the gentry or from the landed aristocracy, from gentlemen farmers. And where did they get the revenue? By exploiting the wage labourers in the countryside. It came from existing flows of rent and profit extracted from the working class in Britain. The fact that they had a sweet tooth didn't create any extra funds for industrialisation. If anything, it meant that they were spending it unproductively. Now, Marx points out that primitive accumulation is not a matter of money. It was about creating a class of landless labourers who had no option but to sell their labour power. And the key events were 
the enclosure of the common lands in England and the Highland Clearances. And without this, without these having taken place, there would have been no class of landless labourers who were set to work to build canals, railways and mills. Now, people building these mills, people building these canals, had to be fed. So another precondition of industrialization was the existence of an agricultural surplus. Those who remained on the land had to be able to grow enough food to feed those that were building the canals. But wages were so low that people doing heavy labour certainly couldn't afford sugar. It's far too expensive. Early 19th century labourers got their calories from bread if they were lucky, more probably from potatoes. And if they got bread, it was a matter of buying meal and baking something at home. It was potato harvests rather than sugar cane that fed industrialization. 